the official UK Beef Magazine podcast. Hey you guys, a very big welcome back to the UK Beef Magazine podcast. Now you're here with uh, me, Z, uh, and I'm one of your co-hosts. And as ever, I'm here with my co-hosts, Neil Cranwell and Robbie Anchat. Now guys, we've got a very packed podcast lined up for you today. Lots to discuss. Um, but we're going to skip the introductions today. Like I said, uh, I've got my co-hosts and they're raring to go. But before we dive into that, guys, what have you got? what have you guys been up to? Have you been up to anything good? How are you guys doing? Uh, well, I went uh, on a date last week, so that was cool. How about you, Neil? What did you do? What day was that then? I was on a date Why also. Were married, mate? Yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah we, we, we're, we're married, aren't we, Neil? Oh, no, no, I know you two went on a date. That's like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. We, we went on a where, date. Where, where so did you two go? Like, what's the big deal? The oh, we actually went to Spearmint Rhinos to see your mum, but we, better, we, we didn't want to talk about that because it would embarrass you, you know what I mean? That would be a bit embarrassing, because, uh, yeah. you know, because I think she nicked about uh, 80 quid off me, and I still want it back, you know what I mean? Was she looking she like didn't even give me, mate, she wasn't even, she didn't even give me a proper dance. I mean, I, I really want my money back. I definitely do. How about you, Neil? Did, so you, did you get anything? Uh, well, I, think, I think she should have worked at Fisherman's Friends. Oh, really? Because far older mint, that is, a far older mint. Well, definitely. As, <laughs> as they say with Fisherman's Friend, suck them and see. But, you know, there you go. <laughs> like, yeah, don't but, worry about it. Like, like, I, I, have, I have good information. You went, on, you went on a proper romantic date with a movie and meal and, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, what, was it good? Like, was it, was it good time? <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what, Z, I had to make a few toilet trips sitting next to Rob, as you can remember from the Body Power Expo. Wow. Yeah, because wow. Yeah, Neil, Neil just had no choice. He had to just keep farting, and he was such a gentleman. <laughs> oh. So he ran off to the toilet to, to let off a massive big one and stuff. And it was really nice of him. I really appreciate it. So, so thank it's, you, Neil. Uh, appreciate that, that's, mate. That's anytime. all part of Post Contest Rebound. <laughs> exactly. It was. We had so much fun as well because. <laughs> of course, it was. It was yeah. huge. That's, that's the segue. Segue into the conversation tonight. Absolutely perfect segue. <laughs> so, for so that. Absolutely spot Neil's, on. Neil's giving away the topic for tonight. Um, as uh, obviously we we had uh, first podcast was was Neil leading leading into the PCA British finals, and then uh, we had a review of the PCA British finals. So now, Neil, we want to know. Uh, basically, how do you rebound post contest? A lot of guys coming off contest. Um, where where'd you go? Um, just gonna hand it straight over to you, mate. And uh, if you can let us know. Well, I mean, personally, there's you know there there are a lot of variables that will go with exactly how you should plan out your rebound. But some people don't plan it at all. And you know, in the past, I have not planned anything. And you, you know, sometimes you get so frazzled from the shows. That when it's over, the last thing you want to do is think about having any structure because you've been so structured. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you'll go off the rails with your food. You might even skip training completely just because you've almost kind of ground yourself out of that endeavour. Um, and that's actually one of the worst things you can do for lots of reasons. But, yeah, I mean, for the main reason I would put down as the most important reason being your health, you know, if you go from being this person that's been religious day in, day out, training, plus doing cardio and eating a very balanced calorie controlled diet, which your body absorbs and assimilates really well because you've been doing it for so long, and then you just throw all that out the window, you stop doing any exercise, any cardio, and eating tons of processed treats, you know, that you fancied, A, it's going to hugely upset your stomach, but mm. it's it won't take long before you gain loads of fat really fast because... You know, at that point, after being, you know, so insulin sensitive because you've been eating so, you know, low caloric uh, controlled foods for a long period of time, mm. you know, your your body wants to store. It's in a storage position. You're like a dry ass sponge. Mm. And it, whatever you give it post show, it's going to soak up and tenfold. So if you don't use it to your advantage, you can get really fat and huge amounts of edema. Huge, really quick, and like probably loads of people listen to this, and you know, I I don't know if I've ever got that amount of edema because I have, I've been fortunate with the water rebound personally, but some people are terrible with it, putting on like forty pound in literally like ten days, 
and you know the lower back pumps the problem with your health your the pressure it puts there on your heart and your, your blood pressure and stuff mm -hmm. you know it's astronomical really it's such a short period of time mm -hmm. um you know so like the health the healthful side of and also, not only the healthy way of doing it, but the actual most beneficial side to your bodybuilding progress is to do things on the reverse and slowly re, you know, recompensate for those things that you've taken away. So, so what I mean by that is on your diet, if you've been dieting and you're down to, say, let's say 2,500 calories towards the end of your diet, you know, the best thing to do would be just increase the foods that you've eaten on your diet and have more of the same foods that would be the perfect scenario and you look at somewhere like 500 calories over the day and you keep that static for like the week and then you see how your body reacts how much water rebound and how much gain you've put on the scale and if it's minimal or nothing at all because it sometimes can be if you're that structured and can do it that way then I bump it up again and if you're feeling hungry 500 calories again is nothing to go you know, to go mad about and, and do the same. It doesn't have to be an extra 500 calories in the form of one meal. You could spread that across, you know, the six or seven meals that you've been eating. And it's something, you know, like it might be like an extra 50 to 100 grams of chicken here and there across each meal, which isn't tons. But over the course of the day, it's 500 calories. And then over the course of the week, it all mounts up. And there'll be a point that you're gaining nicely, looking nicely and feeling nice. But, you know, having said that, I always recommend, and I mean, I do it myself because we're all human, but I recommend to any of my clients, the night of the show, the day after, at least, I would just eat anything that you've craved. And, you know, I'm not saying it's a free fall, don't eat any decent bodybuilding food, but anything that you've been craving and really wanting, have it. You know, have it. It's, you know, you reward yourself for all the effort you've put in. And a couple of days doing that won't upset the apple cart too much. It might upset your, your missus and, and the old bed covers when they're flying up and down <laughs> in the night because you're full of wind. But apart, you know, if you're just doing it for a really short period of time, I don't think there's a problem in it at all. And I mean, there's a big benefit in it because if you, if you go straight from prep diet to then just more of the same prep foods without some sort of mental break then you it can really you can really burn out from that at some point and just binge crazy at some point through the week or two that follows so the ideal way would be obviously to eat the same foods and increase them slightly week by week monitoring how you go you know you could do it that way as i've suggested or you could have the same sort of foods but put in a couple of cheat meals per week so it still feels like you're part of a structure but every sort of third day you go out with a family and you go out and have you know whatever you fancy maybe burger fries and a cheesecake or something like that, you know. Um, and then you repeat that two or three days later again. So, But between that, you're eating the same similar foods as you was on your prep. That way you bump your calories up without having to do anything really to your diet, but just to have the freedom of the foods that you choose. Um, <clears throat> but, but then <clears throat> having said that, that, that really does, this is like generalizing, but it really does depend on the person and uh, how far down they push their body. So if you pushed yourself down on a diet, but you still weren't totally fat free and you still were holding, you know, some fat and you can't just blame that on water because you weren't actually lean enough then your rebound as such would, you know, the foods that you introduced to go back would be, should be more mild, you know, because you haven't pushed yourself as far. If you've pushed your sort of, you know, your, your body really far off, You've been holding on to that for a long period of time because you've jumped from show to show. You you know, you can give yourself, a, you know, a week's worth of junk food and it won't even stick sometimes. Oh. You know, so you've you can, you can't... Right deep into the cut. And you if you've gone deep and you've gone really past kind of... you kind of over-dieted, I would put it down to, the fact that you're, you're super, super shredded, but you're almost super flat and... You almost can't do anything to fill yourself back up on stage because you put yourself too far. And that often happens when you, you jump from one show and then follow it up two or three weeks later and you try and push that extra bit and you get caught up in this endeavour to try and hit a certain weight or something. And actually, it may be detrimental for you holding muscle size. But, I mean, I, you know, I, I've had to do that when I competed in UK BFF. I had to make heavy weights, which was uh, under 100 kilos. And... I generally compete if I didn't have to make a weight. 
about 104. So, you know, four kilos, which is, you know, over half a stone when you're already stage ready shredded. To knock that off you, it has to come from somewhere. And if there's no fat really or water left on you, yeah, obviously you're going to have to lose some muscle to make the weight class. Uh, and obviously you can look absolutely peeled by doing that, but you can't get a, a full a fullness to the muscle. You can't get a pump because you're, you're over dieted in that respect. So if you're kind of at that point, you can get away with eating a lot more food without it actually affecting you in any way. I mean, um, a good rule of thumb really with it all is to check the scales. And I actually check the scales every couple of days post competition just to see what the rebound is saying. And really, you know, you want to keep it under tabs. And I would say to yourself, you know, the maximum you want to push yourself up in a hit would be something like seven kilos, which is a whole stone, you know, over your stage weight. So if you're 102 on stage and that's dry shredded, it's easy to put two or three kilos on without even blinking just by putting the water back in your body and stuff. And then two or three kilos on top of that would be an excess of like glycogen, muscle volume, and you should look really well at that weight, you know, really full, still vascular, still showing the muscle uh, definition. And it's when you sort of, I've seen it on a lot of people and myself, when you push past that stone, additional stone uh, that you've been on stage too fast, all of a sudden them things blur and you become very bloated. You, 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 the first thing you tend to see is sock marks where you're getting edema in your or water retention in your legs. And then it'll happen around your stomach for most men. Um, and once you get to that point where you're sort of losing your abs and you're losing your, your shins because you've got these cankles going on, <laughs> it's, it, it's, that's a tough place to reel it back from, you know. It's, if you can keep just slightly ahead of the game there, you know, not allow that to quite set in, you can really push that period. And, you know, one way of doing that and preventing water retention is to continue doing the exercise that you've done, and then what I mean by that is a lot of people will finish competition, they just drop the cardio completely. But <clears throat> if you were doing cardio daily, or for some people twice a day, over the course of the week, you're probably looking at burning off maybe, you know, three and a half, four thousand calories, which is a massive offset to what you eat over that week. But if you just take that away, all of a sudden you're four thousand calories up in your diet over the week. So, you know, straight away there, you've, you've got a huge amount of calorie surplus because you're doing less activity. So I, if I was a two-a-day cardio person coming into a show, I would drop it down to one a day, and I'd drop that one session down, say, if you was doing an hour to, say, 40 minutes. So you're still actively moving, and, yes, you are dropping the output, so you are, you are not burning as many calories, but that's what you want. You want some surplus calories when you've, finished um, prepping you just don't want a huge abundance of them because on top of the dropping of the cardio you're going to be adding all these tasty treats and stuff which are full of calories and so the two combined definitely a little lead to like um, you know a bad look and a bad water retention and a bloat and and all the uncomfortable sort of side effects that come with that and um, and then with your training so with your training, it's, uh, you know, some people will just go, right, finish, tr- finish now, I'm off. That's me, two weeks on holiday, or mm-hmm. I'm taking two weeks out of the gym, or whatever. But, you know, as I was saying, you're like a sponge, so is your body. You know, your body to the weights and the stuff, uh, yeah, exercise you're doing. If you can just feed your body them extra calories we talked about, but still give it enough stimulus, but a huge amount of, uh, recline in the intensity in the volume because you've pushed and pushed and pushed yourself to the point of pretty much overtraining running into a show so if you take away a lot of that volume and intensity your body then all of a sudden has this freedom to grow because you're not killing it and knocking it down and down and down which I think is important when you come into prep because it's all about calorie expenditure so the more often you train the more volume you train the longer the sessions all this adds to burning more calories, which helps you get shredded. But when you're trying to put on lean, you know, lean muscle um, on a rebound, it's, it, I think it's very good to still do the basic movements, still look at the strength movements, but don't go crazy trying to throw all this weight back on the bar so soon. Because, you know, a lot of the exercises that you do running into the show, towards the end of the show, sometimes they turn into machines and cables and things because... 
you know, the, the serious compound exercises are just really taxing when you're that flaky or lightheaded yeah. due to the diet and stuff. So then to think, oh, all of a sudden I feel great, competition's over, the stress is over, that itself causes, uh, you know, like this weight on your shoulder which seems to be lifted when the show's done. Mm. And you're full of, like, glycogen from all these extra foods you've eaten around the carb-up period and then following for the few days, plus the additional food you eat, obviously, on top of that. And the muscles look really swollen. And you do add some water, obviously. You can't be a void of water like you're stage ready. But you look like you feel great and full as a house and you do a few sets and you pump up you know, really fast, really easy. And in the gym, you know, you're thinking, oh, why didn't I do this on stage or look like this on stage? But obviously on stage, you'd look like a blurred version. But in the gym, you kind of stand out and look fantastic and all the veins are popping everywhere. But that's the best time to get injured right there. Because, you know, lots of people run into show, they'll use certain, you know, anabolics and certain anabolic drugs like Winstraw are notorious for drying out your joints. Uh, you're obviously going to dry out your body and your joints by dehydrating yourself and if you do that several times in a short period you're going to dehydrate the muscle and the joints there with the water that you're taking out of your body mm. uh, but all of a sudden you feel good and nice and big and strong and fresh and not so tired because you're not training as often you go back to them big lifts and you, you, although your mind might feel great your body's still really been through the wars and mm. the sensible thing to do is drop yourself back to like a you know, a pre-working set weight. So if you've done four sets, kind of the weight you would get up to on the third set, which doesn't quite tax you properly, oh. and call that your working set for this, you know, this little time period where you're transitioning back to more intensity. Because um, not only is that safer and healthier on your joints, prevent you getting injury, but your body will actually grow and appreciate that more because you're, you're not overtraining it, you're not hammering it down and you're giving it enough chance to recover and recuperate. And I think that's really important. And, and that's something I've fallen foul for a few times. And hence, you know, I've had a full chest reattachment because after my show two years ago, I've done exactly what I've just told you not to do. Because uh, I went in the gym, I was feeling, you know, I was doing chest and straight on the bench and everything the weights flew up because of the water you know i had in my joints and i got pumped to look fantastic and you know in hindsight it would have been better to you know take several days off. i think people should take somewhere between sort of three and five days off after the show so their body feels fresh and recovered and mentally they actually want to go to the gym again um and enjoy it again and then you know take the take the frequency down to say, you know, like most people end up doing, say, six days a week into a show. Maybe cutting that in half is probably a good place to go or, like, train every other day. So you have a day in the gym, you do a bit of cardio as well. On a day in between, you just do a bit of cardio, maybe some sort of core work. And so you keep active, you keep the fluid moving so it's not going to settle. Uh, and you work out as if they were sort of pushing on, uh, you know, an hour and 30 or longer through the contest prep. And then each week you increase that weight, but you do it slowly. Same with the diet. There's so many bodybuilders, like we all are crazy to get everywhere, uh, sorry, to get anywhere fast. And by that, I mean, if you quickly go ramp your calories back up from 2,500 to 5,000, for example, or 4,500 within a matter of weeks, and you ramp your training loads up from a comfortable sort of like uh sort of down workouts that you might have to follow a week of a show or so so you know like that's the saying slowly slowly catchy monkey <laughs> it, it kind of goes along with with this you know if you take small steps and yes you might be able to lift more but you're gonna add more weight than you've done last week so it might be five kilos or two and a half kilos say to an olympic bar but in the following week you can add the same again and increasements continually go on as the weeks go on and you continually make progress in the gym. And then you, what will happen is your previous set weight that you were stuck at, you will bypass because you've made slow increments to do so. And that's how you should really structure your training to follow. It, and, and the key point is not to rush back to full bore. And the same with the diet. I mean, the flip side and the worst case I see with clients is you just go on a binge Total binge post show because you've had enough of competing or being around bodybuilding foods or whatever, and the same with the diet and the training and cardio totally stops. 
and then you just throw on tons of weight and you really set your off season progress up to a really, really terrible bad start and pretty much nowhere to go. Whereas if you structure it and you slowly creep everything up from your weight training sessions to your food and then, you know, you, you obviously reintroduce supplements at some point down the line as well, that gives you another kind of further step up the ladder and it keeps things moving gradually, you know. So as things keep moving gradually, your body slowly adapts to these things and that's the way to make progress. Now, in all the years that I've trained and competed, I found the best way for me personally to make progress, and, and Rob will tell you his opinion on this as well shortly because I'll shut up in a minute because I'm boring my own self, <laughs> is, um, is, is to, if you do a show and push yourself down low, you've almost got this honeymoon sweet spot period, almost like you were a beginner again, where everything you do makes an improvement. And if you, if you do it sensibly, as I've, as I've mentioned, you'll get to a point where if your set weight where you was a lean 10%, a body fat for example was say 16 stone you would now your new set point if you do it this way post show because your body is like a sponge and wants to absorb and utilize these nutrients and take advantage of the the weight training sessions mm. it would be something like 16 and a half stone mm. looking exactly the same but you're half a stone bigger and uh, in the past when i've tried to just do that pure off season add more food you know, structure the training different and just keep pushing things up. There's a point in your body where, and everyone's sort of set point to this is different, but you get to a point where you stop looking like you're gaining muscle and you just start accruing fat. And you can be 16 and a half stone, but you look like a fat 16 or a soft 16 and a half stone. So you cut the calories back, put in a bit of cardio, drop back to 16 stone and back to where you're happy with your 10% weight, but you're stuck there. And it's hard to push past that when you're kind of at the, you know, I'm talking about like the top end of your sort of training where you've been training more than five years and, you know, you, you know you're know you more of an advanced trainer and you kind of hit a wall. Mm. So my way I found to overcome this, because if you're not naturally gifted to just keep throwing muscle on, is, you know, if you push your body down into sort of a time of crisis almost, it will rebound and almost try and protect itself that by being that much bigger uh, for the next time something like that would happen. So if you ever caught an illness, you know, if you've ever caught an illness or cold or whatever, and you're, you know, off your feet in bed for a few days, you might lose tons of weight. But as soon as you get back to eating and back to normal life and a bit of training and stuff, your weight kind of bounces back to that set point. And uh, that set point tends to go up about half a stone if you do things right, which half a stone in a year, if you do one show, is fantastic. Brilliant. And that's the, and what's your what's your views? I mean, that's that's my views on that, Rob. What about yourself? Well, I'm, I'm <coughs> currently nice and fat, and I've been probably off season for a good year and a bit now, coming up to two. Um, so when did I last do a show? I think it was. Uh, how old is How old is CJ? He's one. How old is CJ? He's one. One. So, yeah. One. Yeah, it was this, one. Yeah, this time last year. Well, it was actually April time last year. Um, me and Neil were going to do a show together, Nava South East. Uh, but Neil had to duck out of that show for the simple reason his son was being born. Um, so it's yeah. going to be a good year or so. Uh, I'm not forgive him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you made me miss my show. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, so well, I haven't really dieted solidly at all for a good like, year now. Um, and it's interesting to see what happens uh, to, to the body because I'm older as well. And as I've got older, it seems to be a lot easier to sort of like keep and hold on to fat. I've got to work so much harder in order to get rid of that fat. And it just kills me. I remember a time, um, basically, the harder you diet, the harder and the more fat or the more water I, I, I put on at the end. I remember one time, I think I put on literally two stone in two weeks. And that's uh, wow. Wow. serious. And I had cankles. The, can the ankles swelled up. They got really, really fat. And I could, because I took the time off the gym, I, I, I literally did exactly what Neil said, don't do. I took about, almost coming up to about a week and a half, two weeks off the gym. Everything was aching. I didn't want to go back to the gym. I was just eating lots and lots of food, eating uh, fat, salt, and uh, sugar. When, you, when, you, when you've taken all of those out of your diet and you suddenly put it back in again, what happens is your body just absorbs a ton of water. And, and most of that, you know, uh, was just water bloat. 
and literally the water came up my legs so my first of all i had like the elephant uh, elephant ankles you know like the old ladies you see you, you, you know, nora batty have you seen nora batty she's sexy she is yeah Perfect. i love nora batty Tom and Jerry advert. And Tom and Jerry yeah. cartoon, yeah? There we the go. Mum. The oh, yeah, the Thomas! Mum. Tom and Jerry. Thomas! <laughs> That's the one, yeah. <laughs> and wow. and you, see the, you see the fat going all up the leg. And literally, my fat, I was, I was looking at my thighs, looked fat as well. But then, I have to admit, it was quite funny because, actually, I won't lie, my dick got fat. And, <laughs> you know what? This is too much. This is not good. Because it actually hurt to pee. So I said, right, this is enough, and I'm going back to the gym, and I'm not doing cardio, because I can't live life with a big, fat elephant dick. It's just not It's just not a good look. It's just not the sexiest look ever. So, yeah. And your male clients didn't like it, did they? Well, they, they didn't mind, to be honest. You know what I mean? And Z would have loved it. Oh, Z would have been all over me. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, he's African. He doesn't mind these yeah, sorts of jokes. One of the things you want to be careful of when you're coming off your contest, guys, is get the fat cock. Oh, <laughs> well, you've heard it here first. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> to be honest, I, I think I took about five Viagras to try and keep it at that sort of size. But, you know, you can't have everything. <laughs> and that was the day he met, Mar uh, he met Sammy. It's all, yeah, gone the the day, yeah. it's all gone downhill for us since then. Where is he? Yeah, where have you yeah, gone, Rob? I don't know. I did. She, she said to me, she said to me, um, darling, could, could you please have a six pack for the wedding? And I said, yeah, it's in the fucking fridge. And so I said to her, there's no way I was going to get a six pack. I did try and it just didn't happen. If anything, I just literally, I got fatter. And then we actually, um, myself and Neil, we actually did a strip tease at oh, my yes, wedding. I heard about this. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun, and uh, it was great because Neil was in shape, and it was so dark, and it, that was cool. That wasn't a problem. But what was really funny was the fact that, um, you know, when I took my clothes off, uh, Neil started laughing at me. Thanks, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funniest thing was he wasn't actually even looking at what I had, my package. So, so, he was just looking at my belly. So, so let, me, let me just, let me just paint, like, uh, let me just... I couldn't see you. past it, mate. Let me, let me just explain for, for, for the listeners, because, like, from my understanding, from, like, so basically, um, you, 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 uh, your best man, and, uh, you, like, you all got together, uh, and you did a strip dance for your new missus. That's what I understand this. That's and right, she yep. she was sat there on a church, red, uh, oh, no, no, a chair, red-faced, watching how many blokes was it <laughs> three three uh one, one of us were in shape yeah one was fat and hairy yeah. and one of us was just fat <laughs> so she had you know she had the pick of the bunch really she really did you yeah. know uh it was quite funny because she was basically going ooh, and then she was trying to hold her sick in it was it was quite amusing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think to myself, poor girl. Well, <laughs> you know? that, yeah, that is the poor way thing. to treat yeah. you. For <laughs> Absolutely, you know that what I mean. Great. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, it was fantastic. Actually, yeah, I didn't get anything that night apart from no, I didn't get anything that night. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. Same as that, son. Same as that, son. On my wedding night, just got a yeah. nice good night's sleep. Yeah, but well, I, I had a baby in my room, room, so there's there's a little bit of. Uh, you know, a, a way out, but it's not quite as it's not it's quite serious. as romantic when you got you got a baby sleeping on the bed because there was uh, no cot provided uh, with you two, and it's just sort of bouncing around to the side of you. It <laughs> weren't the was, one. I was terrified on my on my wedding night. I was after me. I was like, I was terrified. I had to, I had to go and hide the strap on. I didn't have a choice. I was so scared. I just didn't want to do it. You know what I mean? No was that the wedding gift, was it? Yeah, I thought so. I thought, Neil, why did you give me this? I mean, it's <laughs> it's too big. It's just far too big. What it was, it was for her, this? mate. It was for her, not for you. You see, you didn't tell me that part. It just said, for Sammy and Rob. I mean, like, you know, get it right, mate. Damn. I just looked at that and I thought, oh, my God. It looks like Z in, in an alleyway. <laughs> you know, I was just really worried about that. So... But, but, but sorry, sorry, gents. Like I'm just um, like I had I had something just to pick up on something Neil. Just to just to go back on um, 
and uh, what we were talking about post contest. Very, very interesting question. Neil, Neil picked up on something. He was saying, um, obviously, going into contests, you, you'd usually be um, looking at things like wind stroll and stuff like that. So, what mm. sort of supplement, like, what sort of uh, gear would you be looking uh, in and around? How would you, how would you play that? Um, well, personally, I come off everything. I, I don't stay on anything for me because. Uh, you know, I mean, some people say, yeah, yeah, go on another stack and get really huge and stuff. But for me, straight off, straight off, straight off. For me, I come straight off because sometimes I've been on for too long. You know, sometimes I've been on for like 12, 14, 16 weeks, and I just think um, your system takes too much of a hammering. You know, so for me to to maybe prevent crashing, I do a few, a couple of things. I might just do like uh, 25 milligrams of Anabar daily for about four weeks, something like that. That might help. Um, also, um, what else did I do? Yeah, possibly uh, uh, 15, 20 mils of um, Dianabol, believe it or not. And I use that to bloaty, prevent... Yeah. It is bloaty, but you're not taking you're not taking enough to actually grow. Right. So, you see, I mean, in order to sort of like get growth, etc., depending on your body weight, of course, I, I think you should be taking probably 30 to 50, uh, 60 milligrams and stuff daily, really, to, to, to sort of enhance and cause growth. So I would be literally taking about 10, 15, 20 maximum. And the idea of that is to prevent, um, it prevent what we call crashing. Uh, because what happens is when you sort of come off gear, your body tends to crash as in like because because your balls cannot produce the amount of testosterone that you are actually taking in in the first place so that's what happens to a lot of people and they crash or they just lose energy or they lose strength or they lose impetus and they don't really want to train that hard anymore so for me personally that's what i do to um to stop that from sort of happening how about you neil what, what do you do on a do you actually do a course after after you on your rebound well, well, I, you know, there's sort of two schools of thought on it. You know, where, where I was saying about how you're like a sponge and you, you know, you're ready to suck up nutrients, etc. Often running into show, people pull a lot of uh, the more androgenic compounds out because they tend to hold water, yeah. um, and they use more of the anabolic compounds that don't. So there's a lot. You know, it's kind of two schools of thought. Some would say like if you if you're prep. And your gear use wasn't particularly long running into a show. You could follow the show with like a, a full week of, of a high androgenic course to help along with the rebound of the food, so that it really does heighten up the amount of uh, the amount of, sort of lean weight you put on. Um, and obviously, you get that heightened sort of sense of sort of strength, and you know you get that, your hormones back, and you feel you you know you feel more male about yourself. And more sort of, you know, you get all the horn back and stuff that has left you since uh, the last few weeks of the prep. Yeah. Um, now, I think it really could depends. You, could you, could you um, just, just obviously, I'm, I'm quite, so you were androgenic and what, what sort of specific, could you be slightly more specific, um, just give us some examples? Um, well, uh, yeah, so like more the long acting esters, people that people would use things that have more of a water retain, a water, yeah, they basically water retain a lot more than some of the more anabolic compounds. So, um, things like a, a longer acting ester, testosterone, whether it's an amphate, cyprinate, that kind of thing. Uh, same with like a longer acting anabolic, such as Deca, or they might use an equipoise, that kind of thing, which are more water retaining, like longer acting. And then orally, you're looking at things like anapalon, um, or even Dynabon, which, you know, are, are heavy hitting, and, and yeah, and they, and they have a good effect, um, but they retain a lot of water. So there's some would people... Say, be, would you say you'll use that, or you wouldn't use that? Uh, I, now I wouldn't. I wouldn't because... I tend to sort of run a course for 12 weeks, which and I think once you push sort of past 16 weeks or 20 weeks, it's really kind of you're, you run out of the, the, the use kind of outweighs uh, the benefit. Um, and often if I do one show, I'll tend to do two or three within the month that follow. So a 12-week initial prep into the first show, as long as I do well in it and it pushes me on to 
the next shows you're looking at you know maybe running a 16 week or so cycle and yeah. you know if sometimes that leads on to another show and then before you know it, you're 20 weeks in uh, mm-hmm. for me then I, I'm, I'm more co- conscious about my health than than, than anything yeah. else really and it's time to really get out and and reset everything and, and put in a lot of health supplements uh, over the counter supplements uh, i think tudka's an amazing amazing uh, supplement for your liver it really does bring your liver values down if they're high and i know because i did actually have really high liver enzymes uh, in my last tests and what's the before name of that I should... tudka which is t-u-d-c-a can't really get it out of health shops here. A lot of it comes from America. You can get it online, even eBay sell it. But um, it's that. I mean, like, I mean, we talk about liver health and stuff. And basically, if you if you if you take too many oral steroids, they're going to affect gut bypass through your liver, and uh, and 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 to an extent your kidneys. And uh, kidneys are hugely affected by diuretics. Mm-hmm. Most people use some sort of diuretics or dehydrate anyway, running into the show. So they always get affected. And then often a lot of bodybuilders use running into show things that make them dry, you know, the, the steroids that make people dry, as I mentioned earlier, winstrol. But then there's anti-estrogens that have a really, really good drying effect to the body. But they're, they're, they're terrible on your blood lipid profiles. <coughs> now, things like Arimidex or Letrozole especially just knacker your, you know, your good and bad cholesterol ratios out. Mm. Um, so the safest, healthiest thing to do is have your blood test done. And I mean, even now, uh, I mean, you can go to your GP and most GPs will do them for you. Um, some bit funny about the reasoning behind why you want them done, but I've always gone to my GP and they've always done them for me. But I know there's private companies that do them. Now, I know there is one I have used before called MediChecks, which I think they're um, they do one, I think it's called a Wellman test, which basically tests pretty much everything, thyroid, mm. testosterone, liver, kidneys, uh, HDL, LDL, free testosterone, pretty much everything you need to know. Yeah. Uh, and it gives you a, it gives you a, you know, it gives you, it gives you a brain dead chart as to what's the normal ranges and, and, and what's elevated and, and, and kind of reasons why these things might, might be so. And I think it's about hundred. Offer you advice? Does it offer you advice on how to? Yeah, there is. Yeah, there's like well, they don't. It, it doesn't in the pack that they send back to you, but there are phone numbers you can call for advice and stuff. But, um, I mean, personally, for me, if I ever want advice on anything to do with steroids or readings or anything like that, my go-to guy is Dave Crosland, which I know you know, Rob. Um, but Dave Crosland, um, he's actually going to be a guest on this show in a couple of weeks. He's like the go. He's like the encyclopedia of uh, performance enhancing drugs. Really, he's probably the fellow in the UK that is the go-to. I would say that knows he's on top of everything, and you know he teaches this as a profession. So, yeah. I mean, he's a very knowledgeable guy to the point of he stands up in court to give his professional opinion if there's ever a court case on steroids. So, you know, he's he's at that level, but. I would always go to him because he's got um, he's got a bodybuilding angle on things. Because in the past, you know, I've been doing this twenty years. I've gone through my GP to a you know private endocrinologist, which is testosterone specialist, and they they, they know that they know the textbook you know generic textbook values and reasons and stuff, which is slightly not the same as in the sporting kind of manner where these uh, performance enhancing drugs are used. Because obviously they were used originally, testosterone and stuff were, were used for medical reasons. So that's where the journals are kind of citing their information from. Um, yeah, so yeah, so going back to your point, so the androgenic compounds are the more long-acting, sort of more water-rebounding type products. I could feel I could benefit from just doing four weeks of something like this. So my actual overall length of time isn't excessively long. I probably wouldn't bother doing that now because you've... You find if you if you push yourself from one show to another to another and you run in eighteen weeks or twenty weeks or so, you notice that your receptors are kind of down regulated because things don't seem to be working quite as well as they did as say halfway through the prep. Yeah. Things don't seem as potent. Uh, and obviously, you know, some bodybuilders out there will just up doses of things to try and make that so. 
Um, I, I'm no, I, I actually sort of pull doses away running into the show because I think as you get close to the show, all the, all these compounds and other supplements and stuff can do is make you retain more water. I mean, the side effect of anything like that is for your body to retain some water. Um, I just think you need a very minimal amount as a base to protect yourself against muscle loss through the diet. Yeah. So that's kind of my thought on it. Um, so I, I would pull out and 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 uh, look at say you know if you're young and you know you're fresh to it all still like running a really good PCT, which would be like for for me my go-to PCT would be HCG. And um, and I actually not too fussed with Clomid, but you could put Clomid in with some Novadex just to block estrogen and reset the testes into working. And the sooner you get your own production up and going, the sooner you stop losing any gains. Because if you've gone from having a, you know, a hell of a lot of testosterone and stuff artificially put in your body and then you just stop and your body will be in a really high estrogenic state then. And it's a really play, bad place to be in terms of retaining water for your hormones, for how you feel. And also, you know, it's a really easy way to store fat and get all the characteristics of a woman. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you can block that from happening, which would be like the, the Nulvadex part of it, and then if you can reset your testes, which would be the, the, the uh, HCG, and then the Clomid increases your sperm count, it kind of gets your own system firing again. Um, as you get older though and most people in their 40s the PCT route doesn't really have much of an effect but it does depend how long you've been using for how many times you've used gear and you want to try and return back to normal it does take longer than it did when you were young even with the best PCT so for sort of individuals like that if they've had tests done and you know I'd only really advise it if you were under the doctor and you'd been to the doctor and they'd they tested you post show, and you're looking at sort of six to eight weeks since you've come off gear. And if your your levels haven't still returned back to somewhere near normal, mm. you know they might not ever do so because of your age. You know, testosterone deteriorates with age, and so in that case, a lot of people do what's called bridging, or they'll just do like a maintenance dose. They might you might have heard the term, and that's just taking a you know a real baseline level of testosterone. Normally, people take it once a week or once every 10 days. Mm. And that just puts you, doesn't put you on like, like as if you're on steroids as such and you're getting a performance enhancing side of it. It just stops you feeling like an absolute eunuch <laughs> and wet lettuce. And it just brings yourself into just feeling normalized again. Mm. Um, and, and so people will run this sort of cruising period of that one shot every week or so. For as long as they decide they're kind of off, but they're only not actually off as such, mm. but that's kind of their off period. Or for other people, it'll be a PCT and then actually off everything. Um, and then uh, and then see how you go with that. But like Robbie says, a lot of people in that state, they, although steroids themselves aren't addictive, uh, the characteristics of their results can become addictive in certain people's uh, personalities. And by that, I mean, you know, unless they're using steroids, there's no point training and there's no point eating, right? Because they've got an addictive personality where it's all or nothing. Yeah. So then people are hard, you know, they're, you know, that they're always, I think they're always, you're always going to find that they're the people that don't really change year to year yeah. because it's a time that you're not on gear, that you're not prepping, that you're not dieting, that you actually grow muscle. And that's what you will unveil the next time you do diet. A lot of people, they don't get the muster and the fire in their belly until they've got a show on their horizon and they're stacked full of gear. Mm. And by then, the gear's only there to preserve muscle. So, you know, the key, and I actually think the hardest thing about bodybuilding is the off-season. Because yeah. you've got to increase the food to the point of hating it in order to grow. And you've got to train with the intensity and the increased strength on sets week after week that you almost fear the training session to come because you know what sort of weight you're going to have to push. And it's the weights that you push in the off season that, that transpire into how you look when you pull off all the fat and water. Mm. So a really productive off season leads to, you know, to the most improvement on stage. And I really noticed this myself where 
when my off season would come, I might go out partying a little bit on weekends, have a few drinks here and there, still train. Mm. It might take me a couple of days after the weekend to get my intensity up because there's a hangover looming. Um, I might do it every now and then. And my diet wouldn't be right. If I was on seven meals, I might be on four or five with, you know, something crappy in the evening every now and then because mm. I ain't got a show lined up. As soon as the show's lined up, boom, I'm like tunnel vision for it. And that's something I've done in the past. And in the last probably three or four years, well, I've made probably the most progress to my physique is where I was just as focused and educated and structured in the off season with a diet plan, with a training plan that I was in the contest period. Um, me, me personally, yeah. I mean, I would just use, like I said, I just use a few orals, etc., to prevent crashing, especially after a long cycle. I try not to use long cycles now because as you get older, your base testosterone lowers. So, and as, as that lowers, it's much harder to sort of, um, you know, get by, shall we say. And, uh, you know, I mean, Neil's a hardcore uh, bodybuilder at the end of the day. I mean, the guy's given himself his own vasectomy. I mean, like, how many people do that? You know, that's, that's, just, that's just amazing. That really so, so just is. Just to so, on something he said, so do you find, um, as, as you get a bit older, that PCT doesn't work for you? Um, to be honest, I... I don't rely on the gear. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an old school kind of bodybuilder in the sense that I really rely on my training to keep my muscular size. Uh, but my my problem is really with fats. Oh, I hate fat. Fats and me seem to just go hand in hand. So as I've got older, it's been harder to shift uh, like belly fat, for example. Um, I know exactly how to do it. It's just getting your head round to actually doing it is the hard thing to do. But yes, I, I will get, get on it, especially in this lovely hot weather. It's much easier to do. It's just like, you know, drinking, doing a little bit of cardio. You don't even have to do that much cardio. You're just you're sweating walking down the road. Mm. Um, but yes, it, what I find really interesting about doing all of these sorts of shows and getting ready every year is you find, when you think you found what it is that works for you, this is what happened to me, because I took a few years off. But I found that... Um, it doesn't work for you anymore because you're not 20 anymore. Do you get me? So yeah. what happened was when, what, I, what diet worked for me when I was 20 doesn't work for me at 40. Mm. I have to just completely change it up, you know, whether I have to lower the uh, carbs or whether I have to r raise the intensity of um, the cardio sessions, for example. Mm. Like for me, I prefer, uh, I, I do quite like high intensity cardio sessions, you know, like playing squash and stuff and things like that. Just tougher things where you're, you're actually having fun with cardio rather than just doing the long things on the bike or the um, row machine or the elliptical walker. I mean, don't get me wrong, I definitely have to do the long, um, boring stuff because of, uh, of my body structure. Because uh, unlike Neil, I'm a lot fatter than he is and my body stores uh, carbs a lot higher, higher than he's, his does. His body burns carbs at a much, much faster rate, while my, my body really seems to like to hold on to him. So for me, when I diet, I have to really lower my carbs right down and basically feel like crap for, for many, many, many weeks in order to shift anything off of my stomach. So, But that's the difference with myself and Neil. It's interesting, though, because like I said, as you get older, you then have a new fight and you have a new fight with your metabolism. And then you're trying to learn new things about your body all the time as you're coming down. No, that's, that's, that's really that's very comprehensive, and mm. then I think for for anyone listening, um, if you're coming, we're, we're in uh, bodybuilding season now. If you look um, if you look online, and everyone everyone's competing, and everyone's going to be coming off uh, coming off their their competitive season. So no moving moving straight on. Um, obviously, we always invite our listeners uh, to to send us questions, and the first question. Um, so we're just going to dive again straight into straight into the questions. Um, keep the questions coming, guys. The first question is from a gentleman called. Called Ivan Brooks. Um, this is open to either of you. Ivan Brooks from North Cornwall. Um, he says that he found the last podcast very interesting. Thank you. Um, and he wants to know, in your opinion, uh, are cheap meals or refeed feed? Um, what will, what is your opinion on cheap meals or refeeds whilst on a cut? Do they increase leptin levels, thus increasing metabolism, or is that a myth? It's quite a quite a technical question. Is uh, is that something you guys could uh, could get into? 
Uh, well, I've got my views on it, which is actually, I'll tell you what I tell my clients and anyone I work with, and I, I'm a big believer in cheap meals or refeed meals or whatever you want to call them. Um, it has to be one meal, though. It's not a day. I don't believe in a cheat day. I think that's far too many calories to offset and okay. probably take you the whole week to kind of re regain where you was before eating. Uh, and that really depends on the person. Some people, you know, the gloves are off and they're fucking at it, you know, from first thing in the morning to last thing at night and they've done 10,000 calories of lard and bacon sandwiches and the rest of it which I think is hard to offset but I think like yes you know in terms of how it increases your leptin or your hormones it's, it's been studied tons and, and psychologically I think they're fantastic to have while I diet and what I say to my clients depending on their weight size and level of sort of conditioning if they're kind of a general level of conditioning, I say to every client, regardless if they're lean and they're ahead of the game, you've got to do two weeks on this set diet plan. Two weeks, because if you can't commit to two weeks and get through one weekend without deviating, mm -hmm. you're not going to do the prep. You, if you can't do two weeks, you can't do two months or three months. Yeah. And it, a lot of people can do a Monday to Friday, just can't get through a weekend. And the problem where the cheat meal fit in was because... Oh, all of a sudden it fits into my once a week. I've only got a diet for six days and then every Sunday I go out for, you know, pizza or whatever it works out to be in, you know, the population's eye that kind of reads this stuff on Instagram and don't know the actual truth in it. I mean, this question's very good in that he's obviously got some research into the hormonal side of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and this is where it's actually come from. Where it come from was, you know, studies were done on people and... You, and you diet and diet and diet away, and yes, you lose weight, and yes, you lose fat, and, and at some point, you'll also lose muscle, and then there'll be at some point, your body goes, no, screw this, I'm not losing any weight in any direction, because I want to survive. I don't want to look shredded, I don't want to, you know, my goal in life here is, as a human body is to survive, not to get on stage. So when you cut your calories too far, all of a sudden, your metabolism will stall, and your body has to learn to re-kind re of... Um, re renew the way it uh, uses energy in order to conserve as much as it can so you don't lose weight even at a lower calorie like so survival get to... <laughs> exactly survive perfect word yeah so survival mode is where you go so you know with people I think you cut yourself down to a point where your body's been depleting and depleting and at that point yes a refeed meal will influx a huge amount of calories it is not used to and have an effect both emotionally and physically with how your body reacts to it. And it's actually the carbohydrate content of the meal which has the biggest effect on your leptin or your hormones and uh, your thyroid, which, uh, which are, you know, which are they're the hormones of thyroid and the leptin within your body which are responsible for fat loss and stimulating fat loss uh, and if you take the calories down for too low especially the carbohydrates down for too low these hormones stall mm. so once your weight stalls and your hormones are stalled you're screwed pretty much yeah. so you can really want to push you down to that point where your weight's stalling have a cheap meal now for some people it, you know it's going out and having a cheap meal which is like a free course meal of their choice or for others it's just uh well, I would make it a refeed day would be for other people that are mentally can't face eating junk food because they're in a diet and it will offset them to eat bad for the rest of the day. Mm. I would give them clients a refeed day of additional carbohydrates to each of their meal from a good complex, you know, typical bodybuilding standpoint carbohydrate. And, you know, and often at that point when you've been dying a little while, you, you're just looking forward to eating some more food, some more carbohydrates, some extra serving of oats, an extra serving of sweet potato or whatever, you know, and people actually enjoy that because mentally they haven't been dirty and eating some dirty ass burger mm -hmm. and then their, their brain hasn't switched into, oh, what else can I eat in mode? Mm -hmm. uh, for other people, they don't want all the same bodybuilding foods because it's pretty standard boring and they'd love to have a meal out with their family and, and they're good you know for them people what i mean what i normally say to clients is the choice is yours easier two options which person are you if you decide to go for the cheap meal go out for the meal because you haven't bought in so there's no additional food hanging around the house for you to keep picking at mm. you know you go out you have your free course meal when you leave the restaurant that cheap meal's finished it's finished and go for it in the evening and I'm like, yes, I know calorie expenditure in the evening is less. It would make sense to go for it earlier in the day so you could burn some of it off. But if you start in the day, you've got the whole day to think about food. 
Mm. You know, you eat something nice, you don't want to go back and eat broccoli after that, the meal that follows that. Yep, that's good, yep. Do you know what I'm saying? So, like, psychologically, if you leave that towards, like, your last meal or pretty much a meal before and go out for it, then, you know, you are pretty much going to bed after that. So, it's cool. It's easy to, it's easy not to bend the rules any further. And, in, and that will have an effect on your metabolism in that the calories will spike your hormones to work again. And yeah. I, this is the individual thing is it doesn't have to be every week. And that, that's where it's kind of fallen into this um, bad press that everyone has a cheat meal a week. We haven't even been dying to a deficit that your body wants to store. We've only been doing it six days. Yeah. You know, you need to be at a point where your body's kind of looking for a way out because you've been pushing it fairly hard. So with my clients, that's either two or four weeks generally, somewhere between that, depending on how lean they are. Mm. If they're really heavy, I, you know, I think your body can continually make progress losing body fat for at least four weeks before it needs any help with a boost in form of a, a refeed. Mm. Uh, but for some people that are leaner, two weeks is enough, and then you can give them the boost and it will still have the same effect without you having to make them suffer an extra two weeks. And for me, dieting is about making it uh, fun. And it's not a fun thing to do, but why <laughs> suffer? Mm. Why suffer if you don't have to suffer? You know, if you can use seasonings and, you know, these uh, sugar-free sauces and m mustards, ketchup, so things to make life a bit more interesting in your diet, and it won't affect the way you look, well, why suffer and eat the most boring foods? I mean... Mm. I've, I've done all my last prep that I've done eating, you know, some standard bodybuilding foods because I'm a good fan of tilapia. I like that in, in, in diet phase. But I use lots of game meats. I've used loads of game meats throughout the prep. And they're things like, they've, they've got loads of flavor, loads of variety. And, you, know, you, can, you can get like buffalo sausages, kangaroo burgers. Uh, one of my favorites I had was um, that Belgian blue, you know, that monster sort of uh, bull on looks like it's on steroids it's our biggest yeah. fucking uh, missing oh, the yeah. chromosome isn't it so, <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> That's the one. I well i come across belgian blue steaks and they're amazing wow. and they're zero fat wow. you know because yeah. they're so lean and muscular there's zero fat so you can eat that like you can eat white fish yeah. and if you give me white fish or steak i know what i'm taking all day long yeah. Yeah. you know so i i i, I worked out you know, uh, the, the, the macros are very similar, still really high in protein and, and with, just with loads of different flavors. So that's how I dieted. And I really found the diet process really easy because of the variety. And so that's where I would go with the cheat as well is to, is to depend on the person and depend on the length of time that they're on it. But mm. other people, they won't cheat at all and they'll prep the entire way through. So they're on a diet, I'm on mm. a diet, I'm not cheating. Uh, and, but if that's your thing, I don't, I don't think it's, it's terrible, but you are going to come points where your body gets stuck and you at least need a carbohydrate spike at some point. That's I brilliant. find that as well. Yeah, it takes me about um, two months, though, to at least two months to get rid of all the fat before I can even think of um, <laughs> refeeding. And when I do a refeed for me, what I will do is I'll do about four days of low carbs and then one day of medium carbs. But for me... I try not to do the, um, the, the the major cheats because with me and the major cheats, I just go a little bit mental and I find it I need about sometimes four days to get to, to offset the damage that I've done. So rather so than what, having what four of, days... What sort of damage are you talking about? You have like 12 burgers. What, what sort of, uh... Well, the damage is, like for example, my body, for example, can digest, uh, at that stage, can easily digest something like McDonald's because it's just literally fat, salt, and sugar. Mm. So that, that my body can totally digest that and get rid of it. But, for example, I can't have KFC. I love KFC, don't get me wrong, but I can't have it. Because if I have it, that fats, my body seems to love fat and will hold on to it. And literally, I will just, it will take me five or six days to kind of get back to where I was <laughs> A week ago, sort of thing, you know. So, if anything, I'm doing myself more damage than good. So this deep fat fried, sort of. Yeah, for me, fat. deep fat fried for me is is the worst. Fat. I can't, I can't go. Yeah, I can't get away with that. So I prefer to actually not even taste that because it tastes too good. So mm. I, I don't even go anywhere near it. Even even on the off season, even now. Um, so, so have you ever eaten like a bucket by yourself? Then? Like, no, like, no. I just I just won't do it. I have in the past, but no, I won't do it because. It just causes me all kinds of like problems, to be honest, and it seems to uh, actually raise my cholesterol 
dangerously. I feel dangerously. Um, so I don't I don't even like it. I basically sometimes wake up in the middle of the night sort of going, I'm having a heart attack, I'm having a heart attack. You know, I can't, you know my blood pressure, I'm, I don't feel well, I don't feel right. So rather than that, I really think, it, it, you know, you've got to know as you get older, you've got to know what you can eat and what you can't eat sort of thing, what you can get away with and what you can't get away with. I can get away with pizza, but I do get very bloated the next day. Um, I try not to drink too many uh, milk drinks because I'm slightly... Uh, lactose intolerant as well mm. so little things like that You've, if you know your own body and if you learn about your own body you you can you can kind of work out what you can get away with and what you can't and especially during diet time um i need to diet for slightly longer than someone like neil um um because my i need to really push myself slightly harder um and i always have have trouble like getting paper thin sort of skin and so on uh, but if i ever do again then um I might actually win something. Who knows? I mean, it was very interesting. Probably. Like, um, we mm. went for, for, I think it was, uh, we were, Neil was prepping for PCA Body Power. And we went for a sushi. Um, it was very interesting. Yep. I, I don't Like, uh, the next morning, he woke up. He had, like, uh, sushi's got rice. And he had, like, um, I can't remember everything. Like, sushi. Uh, and uh, the next yeah, morning. high sodium, uh, isn't it? High sodium. Yeah. And he, he woke up looking like um looking really full nice and full jacked yeah um, like he looked like he had refed so i mean um it's it's very interesting so it's, it's about knowing what what to eat as well for that cheat meal so it's been not just going cut like just going crazy and going wherever you want to eat yeah that's really interesting that is interesting yeah so, like i said you gotta be smart you gotta be, be smart, smart about the cheat meal so mm -hmm. ivan i hope that um so ivan if, if you're uh cutting at the moment if you're in the middle of a cut i hope uh these guys have answered your question mate and i uh, hope that um hope that uh, you've, you've taken something away from that so the second question again guys open to either of you um it's from a gentleman called clive taylor and he wants to know in your opinion uh talking about cardio in your opinion what cardio do you think is more effective h-i-i-t or l-i-s-s -S, so that's high intensity interval training or low intensity steady state cardio what uh, what is more effective i'm i'm assuming in losing fat so either of you what's it for you Neil? uh joe i think the most effective cardio is the one that you consistently do and that's pretty much sums it up i think it doesn't matter how you get from a to b as long as you do it every day or whatever is on your schedule and you know some people go rave about low intensity or rave about hit but if you fucking hate doing it don't do it like rob says go and play squash or go and do something that you're going to do and do it consistently and that's like goes for diet goes for weight training goes for life goes for business goes for relationship doesn't it i mean it pretty much fits every every thing you can think of but i mean i've tried both i have a huge believer in old school low intensity long duration get a sore ass on that exercise bike grind it out keep your but, but and said that the old school way of doing it was so slow, your heart rate doesn't even move above 100, you know, RPA, um, beats yeah. per minute, sorry. So, I, you know, any, any of my clients, I tell them, go and get yourself a heart rate monitor. What your cardio I want you to do is low intensity, ideally, unless these people are super fit, then like, going for a power walk is not going to get their heart rate up. And I would look at a heart rate of generally about 120 to 130 beats per minute. And you need to be holding that for the period of time that you're doing the cardio. Mm. That works wonders in burning fat. You don't burn much muscle. But you do sweat, and it is a little tough. It's not like walking the dog. It's that sort of pace. Mm. So, like, for me, I'm really fit on an exercise bike because I've done them for years. So I have to beast that bastard just to get my heart rate up. So I'll even do spouts of high-intensity sprints on that to a longer period of time so like typical high intensity is 15 seconds or so all out followed by maybe a minute or depending on your fitness of a, like a moderate recovery phase and repeat um so and you can change that i mean that's not set in stone you could do 30 seconds all out and a minute and a half rest or, or whatever but I, I i tend to do low intensity with high intensity intervals throughout it uh, if that makes sense. So I still like the long period of time, but because my fitness is quite good, because I, I actually do cardio every day of the year, year round. Mm. So if you're forever doing cardio, obviously you're going to get fitter at what you do. So when I used to walk the dog, my heart rate used to be at 130. Mm. Now I have to run with the dog 
from from time to time in order to get it up and keep it around 130 so but if i take my dog out i'll run lamp posts which is yeah. you know the lamp posts on the street yeah. so i might run between one lamp post and the next and then walk the next one so i've got a little target to meet uh and then i just check what my heart rate saying i might need to walk two lamp posts to still get in that recovery ideal heart rate phase and when it drops down too low, I'll run another lamppost, or it might be run two lampposts, depending on your fitness. So that I mean, they used to call that fart leg back in my day, but the, no one probably remembers that now, apart from Rob because he's older yeah. than me. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still farting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Rob, what's your take, mate? So so Neil says whatever you can maintain, whatever you can keep. Going. So what's, what's your take, mate? I think it depends on the person's body as well uh, and a person's metabolism. Like for example, if you're a hard gainer, let's just say you're an ectomorphic body frame, which is a sort of like skinny guy who finds it hard to put on muscle mass, um, I think high-intensity cardio probably won't be up your alley because if you do all of that, you're more than likely going to lose a lot of muscle tissue. So for, yeah. someone, so for someone like that, I would suggest you know fairly low intensity over a longer period of time. But for someone like myself who's you know, who likes to see, who's, <laughs> who stores a lot of body fat uh, on his off season. Um, what, what, for someone like myself, I would probably say, you know what, I, I think um, you should use intermittent spells of exactly what Neil said, intermittent spells of high intensity cardio, as well as your basic long cardio so, sort of sessions. And I think if you mix those sort of two, you'll get the best results because you'll be kind of like tricking your heart rate really all the time. So sometimes you're burning faster and sometimes you're burning uh, at a slower pace, but the idea is you're constantly burning, you know. Right. So for me, I think that's it, it, it's better, but it all depends on your body type. But if, if you're uh, ector, if you're ectomorphic and then you hardly carry any sort of body fat, should you be doing any cardio at all? Well, this is the thing. I've, I've known ectomorphic guys. I remember there was a a guy at my other gym, for example, who was literally lean all year round, carried a decent amount of muscle mass, and then sort of said to me. I never do cardio. So I thought to myself, right, it's like that, is it? Okay, okay, well, basically that's exactly what I thought. All right, if that's what you do, mate, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it too. And I decided to train three times a day at quite a high uh, intensity type level. So it was a sweating type training sessions. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work for me. I still was carrying a ton of fat. So I realized I wasn't that guy and I didn't have his genetics and, and so on. I think he was actually... Um, I think he was actually like French Ghanaian or sort of something, but so his body wasn't carrying much fat all year round anyway. Um, and I realised, unfortunately, I don't have that body that he has, so that's not working for me. It was a nice idea, I, you know. I thought it was a good idea at the time, and it's the thing. I think it's good to experiment with different ideas because if you experiment with different ideas on your body, then you're going to get different results. If you just keep doing the same thing, you're just going to get the same result. So. I think the, the best advice I can give you is try try different things, you know. I mean, I've challenged Neil to a game of squash. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, so that should be a, a lot of fun. I think we're going to... Oh, I'm curious. Oh, I, I win when I, when yeah. I um, push his missus up against the wall and we play that version of squash. Oh. But other than that, <laughs> yeah, usually... Julian's going to listen to this and stuff for uh, no, she'll never listen yeah. to it. It's great. My missus won't listen to this either, which is why. No, she, you're right about that. <laughs> she is enough of you at home, mate, let alone on the radio. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I mean, uh, uh, so, so, Clive, that's, uh, you know, you've heard it there. Um, Neil and Robbie have both given their take on it. So I hope you've, you've got uh, the answer you're looking for there. Basically guys keep the questions coming in really good questions um some of the questions i'm, I'm a bit stumped myself and it's, it's just good to have these guys here with us so neil touched on it earlier at the, at the beginning of this show but i i'm i don't know I'm, i just i just get excited about nearly everything that's going on in and around the podcast so next week we've got our first guest um and it's not just any guest um really really brilliant guest his name is matt lovell um and he's a sports nutritionist now i could go on minutes uh, about what he's done what he, who he's worked with but I'll give you a quick rundown and I, I, I think Neil can sort of back me up on this he's, he's worked with England um, with the England RFU track and field um, uh, 
he's obviously got lots of clients and he's written books and he's got a column in men's health i mean the list goes on he's not just your run-of-the-mill nutritionist um uh he he is sort of at the top of his field um and he's he's going to be with us next week i need i mean neil how how have you sort of um if you can sort of give the guys a, a rundown and just let us know how you've managed to get uh, get oh, man. Uh, well, yeah, luckily enough, uh, I worked with Matt for many years in Harley Street. So we worked in a clinic in Harley Street, which was a sports nutrition clinic. And in that clinic, we were actually fortunate to get a lot of celebrities, uh, as well as track and field and the rug England rugby team. Uh, celebrities such as Angelina Jolie and Hugh Jackman for their roles in uh, Tomb Raider and Wolverine. You know, their initial films were going that far back. You know, I am over the fucking hill here at 41. So I, I did used to work a nine to five as a in a nutritionist uh, uh, called the Centre for Nutritional Medicine in Harley Street. And and we'd get a lot of celebrity and top sporting guys come into these guys because you'd have a clinical nutritionist and doctors on hand. So we really do get first kind of first hand service in the UK, which I'm sure a lot of people don't realise does happen. But it does. And the transformations you could make were amazing because these guys have got hit roles in like a really short period of time and get in shape in the fastest time. So they would only use pharmaceutical grade supplements, aminos, uh, you know, clinically diagnosed diets, which were all tested, you know, um, on on um, and and recorded by these doctors and nutritionists. And I was fortunate to be part of that team for a few years. And Matt was one of the nutritionists there, which. Wow. I became really good friends with, and he's since then he's gone on and he's worked in you know independently with uh, a lot of the RFUs and and certain rugby teams etc. Uh, he's even brought out his own range of like pharmaceutical grade aminos. I think they're called Amino Man, which I actually used the last uh, in my last prep with Amino Man because with all the supplements that are out there now and all the protein spiking hype this that, and the other that's out there, obviously you just want to trust the brand you're using. Um, and uh, um, Matt uses it on the England teams, and they're tested, you know, religiously because of that. So mm. uh, he he's going to come on. Like we're very fortunate to have him on the show. He's making us get all get out of bed very early in order to do it. <laughs> if anyone wants to look into him, just Google his name, like Matt uh, Lovell, nutritionist or Men's Health, and there's tons and tons of columns he's written. And you know, he's he's my go-to guy for any thing that's kind of really really high tech nutritional uh, advice which is kind of way past what we know as bodybuilders you know and that's that's where he is so i'm sure he'll tone it down for us but he's fantastic with uh, things like trace elements and micronutrients and you know the right dose for actual effects of these things which you know we're only ever given the rda of these things and not really taking things much further and and there's lots of cures you can do with aminos and supplements uh, uh, from vitamins and minerals if you know the correct way of and get the correct form of them because a lot of the companies just produce a cheap option so i won't really awful too much man because yeah, i'm sure we'll discuss I'm, it all what, uh, what next week what i'd like for i mean i i know i'm, I'm gonna get my own questioning because I've, I've got the i've got this seat but um what i'd like is for anyone listening if 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 you'd like to ask matt a question if you've got some burning nutrition questions next week we'll be taking nutrition questions as we'll have a nutritionist uh on board um obviously we'll, we'll just take the best ones but um we just want to get we want to we want to put him through his paces so i've already got a couple of questions that i've uh, i'm probably gonna put to him but really brilliant brilliant uh, guest so really looking forward to that guys so tune in obviously next week and and he'll be here answering all your questions and, and just sharing his, his thoughts and ideas uh skip into the sponsors guys uh, obviously brilliant sponsors um sponsoring the uk beef magazine podcast and i'd just like to just just share um, just just run through them quickly if you could if, if i could um first one obviously muscle finesse now they've been sponsoring neil and, and neil could you just give us a quick uh, rundown of what what you're using for muscle finesse at the minute uh well muscle finesse i've got a variety of all the they do all the ranges from every brand but i use their uh, nxt amino fuel through training and they uh, they do a branch chain and glutamine with vitamin D mixed powder, which I have on sort of morning before my cardio. And I've done that. I've done that religiously, kind of throughout. 
and then obviously they're branded so I can use other brands of like Vitago like Glycofuse from my fusion is something I drink through training Brilliant. and um, and as I said I used Matt's Amino Man uh, in combination with the Glycofuse through training that, that that's my kind of uh, sort of bodybuilding supplements as such and then I'll, I'll use like a a high strength multivitamin and, and stuff like that from them but i've been fortunate enough to wrangle out of them uh, a code a discount code so i'll give you that it's, it's neil n-e-a-l-e 10 and if you go to www.musclefinesse.com you'll save 10 percent on anything you order um i don't think i've told you but i've got another sponsor here which is giving us 20 percent off and uh, the code is uh, N-E-A-L-E 20, you know, surprisingly. <laughs> and uh, and that's with Udo's Choice. So that's www.udoschoice.co.uk. Now, Udo's, if people aren't familiar, is uh, is a brand that got kind of popular in bodybuilding because they done they brought out a, a cold-pressed oil, which you kept in the fridge. And those that are on low-carb diets and put fat in the diets use this... Uh, this great Omega three six and nine blended oil called Omega, uh, sorry, called Udo's oil, mm-hmm. and that's really that become really popular uh, amongst bodybuilders, and they're offering twenty percent off their uh, products off their site. I mean, I actually use their greens. I think they've got the most comprehensive greens formula out of anyone. Um, because, and, uh... Now, I'll tell you what it's done for me. I, I've suffered IBS for like most of my life you know to the point of having medication four times a day or i'm in all sorts of trouble mm. and uh, i've had i've had all the treatment i've had the cameras up the wrong end and all sorts mm. and uh, and um you know since introducing greens to my diet plus they do an acidophilus which is a super high strength it's called super eight i have one of the super eights in the morning and two serves of greens a day one in the morning on waking and one before bed I'm, I've, ne- I've not had IBS, I think, for at least wow. eight, eight years now. Wow. And so, so if ever I... spelling Udo? Sorry, just to... Just to I know it's, um... U- yeah, Udo's is uh, U-D-O-S, and then choice is in C-H-O-I-C-H. Nice. Uh, sorry, C-H-O-I-C-E dot co dot U-K. So Udo's, uh, I mean, he's got... If you search Udo's as well, there's some, there's some really informative... Uh, videos by the doctor behind it it was called dr udo's aramis or something similar to that i probably messed that right up but anyway um it's something worth yeah i could have said something else there could i <laughs> no, that's, <laughs> that's, great, that's great no that's fantastic and we've got another we've got another sponsor to to, to mention um it's jim <laughs> spotter Jim Spotter, um, I actually downloaded their app and it's, it's a pretty cool app, I've used it. So it's basically, um, this, this, this Jim Spotter connects you with, with training partners or personal trainers nearby wherever you, uh, wherever you are, wherever you, uh, wherever you're training. Um, and it's basically, if, if you want, if, if you're looking for someone to train your chest, you can go, go onto the app and say, hey, I'm training chest. And like, that's, that's my understanding. I've, I've looked on it. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And pers- if, if you need a personal trainer, if you don't want to be uh, just sort of training with, with some lump in the gym, if you want someone who knows what they're talking about, you can find a personal trainer and vice versa. If you're a personal trainer and you're looking for clients in the area who are looking for it, I, I th- it's quite a comprehensive app. I'm, I'm quite impressed by it. Uh, mm. And they're actually... Um, they're actually, yeah, so, so they're saying for personal trainers, you'll be able to find a training partner or potential client for free um, if you're an online coach. Um, so that's that's pretty good. Uh, have you used, I, I, I actually saw you on, 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 the, uh, on the app, Neil. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've used the app. The app is very good. I mean, uh, it's a really good concept, and I'm sure there's lots of people out there that think, ah, oh, fuck it, I've got to train legs on Wednesday, I've got no one to train with. You know, and you put this out there and then people in your area can reply and then you can have like a little gym session at your gym or go to another local gym. Um, I mean, for personal trainers, you don't even have to work locally. You can set the, the scan up as such like nationally. So people that even want online coaching can, you know, you can get in contact with them there and you haven't even got to be in their area. I mean, the scope for it is actually pretty big and it's totally free of charge. It's on the app store. So you can just download it straight off the app store, and it's uh, it's it's good to go. So it takes you know it's free to go, but I think they also they're on Google Store and and as well. But I mean, I found mine just by going on the app store on the iPhone, and uh, 
And it's as simple as that, really. And then you can kind of record these things and put in regular dates that you want to train certain body parts so other people that have the same schedules can hook up. And you never know, you might be on a mandate with Robbie next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I was, I was trying it. to find, like, uh, any young girls looking to... Sort of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you the, the booty workout with Z. Oh, yeah, exactly. Any young girls out there who are looking to get pregnant and be an unknown <laughs> Z is your man. I guarantee he will not stick around and you will probably be paying maintenance or child support for the next hundred years. But that's okay. He only earns 50p a week. Don't you, Z? Like, well done. I had, I had, where do I go? Like, ladies, just to issue a disclaimer, everything that Rob just said is not true. I will be there to train with you at all times. I'll be there for your unmarried child. I will be there, I promise. <laughs> hear that? Everyone hear that? You see? <laughs> Heard it here first. Anyway, I need to put a uh, you know, shout-out to my sponsor. Uh, my, my sponsor is uh, Neil at Crunch Gym. Because what happens is, if you write Neil 100, you get 100% off, you go to his gym, and then you just literally steal his supplements and put them in your bag and walk out of the gym. It's a brilliant gym. I'm actually going down there tomorrow to kick Z's ass. So uh, the next part that you're going to hear, more than likely, is going to be Neil crying like a little baby. So, sorry, Z crying like a little baby. Well, are you rubbing my shelves? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not, oh, yeah, I, sh I shouldn't have told that. <laughs> yes, we are. That should be a lot of fun. That should be hilarious. Like, I don't know if you guys know, but I've, I, I, was, I, was, I was scanning through Rob's, uh, his uh, YouTube uh, channel last night. He's done some crazy, crazy shit. He's done, like, uh, like 50 reps of 100 kgs. I don't know who does 50 reps of 100 kgs uh, on the chest press. It's just no, no one does this. Like, just stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, and that's basically what I've, I've got in my mind. So, like, if if if, if I'm not here the next podcast, and they've pulled legs, <coughs> legs, yeah, legs, definitely. <laughs> See, he's got legs some... like a girl. He's got legs like a blooming yeah, got, spearmint dino, <laughs> rhino dancer. He really has a pair of tights. And I tell you what, I'm turned on to the max. Really am. Now, yeah. <laughs> listen, before you wind it up, Z, I've just WhatsApped you over. Yep. A very funny short, well, it's not that short, but short enough for the outro, um, a joke. And it's on your WhatsApp. Moment. I'm hoping you're about to play it across the, your microphone and we'll be able to hear it. Well, you want to uh, selectively play it? I want you to play it off your WhatsApp into your mic because obviously I can't do that as soon as I'm on my phone at the moment. And see if it comes out as we wind the show up just to give people a laugh. Never and it's far better than any of Robbie's terrible jokes. <laughs> all right, like, I, I, I've not heard the joke, so we're just all in Neil's hands right now. So this yeah, is it's a joke. Joke. very cockney. It's very cockney. Listen up. I'm going to try and okay. turn it right up. One sec, it's just... Oh. He goes to a pet shop and said, listen, mate, I want an animal, but have you got anything unusual? And the fella said, yeah, I have. He said, look, I've got a centipede. Yeah. He said, what's fucking unusual about that, then? He said, this one can talk, mate. And it comes with its own ass. He said, straight. He said, I'm telling you. He said, a two -er. So he looks at it, he said, fuck me. Talks and everything, I'm taking it home. Late that night, about six o'clock, he raps on the roof of the ass. He said, Mr. Centipede, I was going down the boozer for a few light hours. You want to come? No, I mean, not a sand. Fifteen minutes later, he knocks on the roof of the ass. He said, Mr. Centipede, I was going for a few beers, be home by eight o'clock, nothing heavy. Half hour goes past, he thinks, what the fuck's going on here? Starts kicking the ass, he said, Mr. Centipede, I'm going down the booze, are you coming? And a little voice shouted back, I heard you the first time, you cunt, I'm still putting me boots on. <laughs> 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 I like that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love that. That's so cool. <laughs> what are you saying, Zay? Tickle you, yeah? <laughs> like, you try to, like, I, I, like, like that's, a, that's a pretty pretty sweet joke. Nothing to do with bodybuilding. You guys are, like, trying to distract me. Like, tomorrow, like, I, I was saying, if, I, if I'm not here, if I'm not alive next uh, next podcast and they've brought in some lackey then I've been killed through some cruel and unusual <laughs> form of punishment like uh, that they call training so yeah just to let you know don't worry I'm, I'm, I'm filming it the cameraman is HD'd up Okay, and every ounce of sweat on camera, and we'll put it on YouTube. Oh, that'll be like, wicked. Looking forward to it. And, like, you've not heard from me. Someone called someone. 
<laughs> well, guys, then, thank you so much again, gents, for joining us. Uh, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, just obviously, big shout out to UK Beef Magazine. Uh, pick up a copy at your local gym. But yeah, take good care. Cheers, guys. Take care. Take Cheers. care. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Now remember, for the perfect recipe, all you need are a few simple ingredients. A little salt, some pepper, some herbs, and not forgetting... The Beef! The Beef Magazine! It's all about beef in action! Over 200 pages showing you the weights, the nutrition, and the supplements. Join Britain's biggest readers. Get the beef at your local newsagent, or go to Alex Mack.